1981, the Detroit Lions looked to join the NFL's playoff elite. The odyssey began at the Silverdome against the 49ers. Freddie Scott out here to the right, and Danielson drops back. Fires it over here, and it's caught at the 32 by Sims. And Sims is going to go in, and he does. Horace King is in there. Scott goes in motion to the right and back. King's goes open. Danielson to throw it into the end zone to Horace King. Cut down. Tied with 22 seconds remaining, and the ball at the 49ers won. Monty had just the man for the job. Third and goal up to one. Sims with the ball cutting inside. Touchdown! Detroit won 24-17. Two tough road games lay ahead. Away from home, the final seconds were not as kind to the Lions. A seesaw battle in San Diego saw Detroit employ some fourth down trickery as Tom Skladany, the league's leading punter, passed to Ken Calica to keep a scoring drive alive. Trailing 28-23 with less than a minute remaining, the Lions march to the Chargers' eight with seven seconds left. First and goal at the eight-yard line. Danielson is back to throw in the end zone, intercepted! That'll be all she wrote with one second left. The following week against Minnesota, Billy Sims keyed a comeback that had the Lions ahead 24-23. This time, with seven seconds remaining, Vikings kicker Rick Danmeyer sealed Detroit's fate with a 20-yard field goal. Last-second losses have a way of haunting teams throughout a season. The Lions had to bounce back and fast, for the world champion Oakland Raiders were next at the Silverdome. The Lions defense made certain the outcome of this game was decided long before the final moments. English, Purifoy, Gay, Baker, and Green. White, Fantetti, and Cobb. Hunter, Smith, Allen, and Oldham. A prodigious display of team defense. The Raiders were shut out for the first time in 15 years. The NFL's best against the run for the second straight season. The Lions defense had help from special teamers Calicut and Murray, as well as from Sims, who wrapped up Detroit's second win in four games with this fourth quarter touchdown. The Lions rebounded at home. If only they could shake the heartbreak of the road. But now another obstacle crossed Detroit's path. Gary Danielson broke his left wrist against Oakland. The quarterbacking duties fell on the shoulders of Jeff Comlo. Comlo started well against Tampa, but the offense stalled after one quarter and finally went under in the second half of a 28 to 10 defeat. The offense was now a concern. The following week in Denver, the Lions relied primarily on Billy Sims, and number 20 did not disappoint. Sims ran for an NFC season high 185 yards and scored two touchdowns. But again, the outcome hinged on the closing seconds. With 28 ticks left and Detroit behind 27 to 21, it was do or die for the Lions. Detroit lost its fourth road game of the season. The disheartening defeat to Denver could not disguise the fact that the Lions' offense needed a spark. In the defeats to the Bucks and the Broncos, 
Sims' already major role was extended even further. But would this be enough for Detroit to win consistently? This was the dilemma Monty Clark confronted as the two and four Lions headed home. Monday night football at the Silver Dome. Against a backdrop of glitter and glamour, a second year third string quarterback named Eric Hippel made his first NFL start. Uh, I came home, my wife said that uh, Gary Danielson called and said that he thinks you're starting. I said, you're kidding. I came in the next morning to Coach Clark. He assumed that I heard, so when he came to me, he had this little smile on his face, and he goes, well, uh, you know, expecting a reaction, I said, what? And he goes, well, I guess you've heard by now. And I said, no, what? He says, you're starting. I go, you're kidding. You know, just to get a response out of him. Clark responded by having Hippel throw long on Detroit's first play. Lo and behold, it was complete. Hippel remembers his reaction. Great, I can complete a ball. <laughs> Hippel managed to do a few more things as well. Perhaps most important of all, he opened up Detroit's offense. Hippel was responsible for all six Lions touchdowns in an easy 48-17 win over the Bears. Hippel brilliantly executed a bold and adventurous game plan, throwing scoring passes to four different receivers as the Lions compensated for the loss of Billy Sims to an injury. Hippel's final touchdown strike was to the fleet Leonard Thompson for 94 yards, the third longest in Lions history. A week later, Hippel scored with less than two minutes remaining as the Lions evened their record at four and four with a come from behind win over Green Bay. In two short weeks, Hippel won the hearts of a team and a town. I guess in, in one aspect, it is kind of like a Cinderella story because you never know when the chance is going to fall on you, and it's always a dream in the back of your mind. But really, you work hard for this moment, and I think you're always projecting in your mind that it's going to be there. So you expect it to happen, I guess, in a way. But you know, then when it really does, I guess, yeah, I guess there's that little bit of dreamy glow about it. Uh -huh. Eric Hippel, from unknown to hero, a tale told only in books, in song, and in film. In this day of space age receivers, Freddie Scott leaves the spectacular and the outlandish to others. Scott is simply a solid and consistent receiver. In 1981, Scott added a few wrinkles to his already first-class act. He was more dangerous as a runner and more likely to beat a defense deep. Last season, Scott became the first Lion in 15 years to gain over 1,000 yards receiving, averaging close to 20 yards a catch. Freddie Scott, one of the key reasons the Lions were the top offensive team in the NFC. After consecutive home victories, Detroit headed west to play the Rams. David Hill's touchdown was not enough the Lions record dipped to four and five. A trip to Washington was next, and Detroit's defense had problems controlling the Redskins' many offensive weapons. But the Lions' offense sparkled as number 24, Dexter Bussey, Rick Kane, and Billy Sims rushed for over 200 yards in a near 500-yard total offense performance. Sims scored twice, the second time on a well-executed option play. It was not enough. The field goal in the final minute left Detroit with a heartbreaking 33-31 loss. A 
a matter of seconds again. As rookie Mark Nichols grabbed Hipple's desperation throw on the Redskins, too, as time ran out. After 10 games, the Lions were four and six. The road was their nemesis. They returned home needing a win badly. Next up were the Dallas Cowboys and the tale of 12. Perhaps Detroit was too high emotionally for the Cowboys. Whatever it was, the Lions were outplayed early and trailed Dallas 17 to nothing with the first half nearly over. Billy Sims broke the ice with 15 seconds left in the half. It was just the spark Detroit needed. But even the Lions couldn't have known what the second half would bring. Mark Nichols' touchdown helped tie the game at 17. In the fourth quarter, the Lions looked to take the lead. Hipple at quarterback, back in the pocket, trying to throw. Fires it over the middle. Complete. Rock! Billy Sims had it at the 20-yard line. He was by everybody. It appeared that Sims would be the GOAT when Dallas scored with less than three minutes remaining. On the very next series, Sims got another chance. He caught Hipple's perfect pass in stride as the turnaround continued. The 81-yard touchdown nodded the score at 24. The Lions would not die against Dallas. They kept coming back and coming back. With the sellout crowd on its feet, Detroit would have a chance to win it. Hipple, using tight ends David Hill, number 81, and Ulysses Norris, passed the Lions into field goal range for Eddie Murray. But with no timeouts left, would Murray get the shot to put it away? There's 14 seconds left. Coming in is Ed Murray. He's in there now. Eight seconds, seven seconds. It'll be from the 37. Here's the kick, and he moves it. And it is good! And the clock runs out. The Lions had finally done it. They'd won in the closing seconds. And the victory was that much sweeter against the powerful Cowboys. The Lions had their biggest win of the season. Their fifth in 11 games. They would need a few more if they were to have any chance of winning a division title. Frigid Chicago. A must-win situation, or Detroit's playoff hopes would be swept away with the winds gusting off Lake Michigan. Against the Bears, it was the Lions' defense that blew away any obstacles. Led by all-pro Doug English, number 78, the Lions held Chicago to 24 total offensive yards. The most intimidating rush line in the league, together with some offensive opportunism, gave the Lions a 23-7 win. Detroit's road affliction had been cured. The Lions were now 6-6, six six, ready for a Thanksgiving Day feast against Kansas City at the Silver Dome. A victory that would keep their playoff hopes alive. Gluttonous Lions devoured the Chiefs, with Billy Sims consummating the holiday bash with a touchdown late in the fourth quarter. The Lions had won three straight behind Eric Hipple, earning a share of first place in the NFC Central. Detroit's playoff fate was now in its own hands. One big reason for the turnaround, number 20.
Billy Sims is unique. His many different runners rolled into one extraordinary package. There's a feeling of power in his wide open style. A startling sense of speed and quickness in his lightning bolts into the secondary. A swelling of outright strength as he fights his way through the heart of a defense. Sims possesses so many natural running qualities that it's hard to pin down exactly what makes him great. All you can do is watch and enjoy. In 1981, Sims broke his own Lions single season rushing record with 1,437 yards despite missing two games. Anchored by the hot line of Dorney, Bollinger, Fowler, Elias, and Bolishweiler, Sims and his running mates led the NFL with 175 yards rushing per game and a near five yard per carry average. Billy Sims, an uncommonly skilled athlete with a rare gift, that of making his teammates better. Through 13 weeks, the Lions were invincible at home. But in Green Bay in week 14, the Lions looked to say goodbye to the Packers a little too early. Vince Thompson's touchdown helped build a 10 to nothing lead, but Detroit fell 31 to 17. But even at 7-7, seven and seven, the division title still beckoned in the competitive NFC Central. Minnesota and Tampa remained at the friendly Silver Dome. Two victories would mean the championship. With 80,000 loyal fans contributing to the cause, the Lions got the first with no trouble, destroying Minnesota 45-7. The offensive line proved again they were among the conference's best as they cleared the way for close to 500 total yards. Gary Danielson also saw his first action since September, teaming with rookie Tracy Porter for the Lions' final touchdown. Not to be left out in a brilliant overall display was the play of the special teams, which featured a punt return for a score by number 83, Robbie Martin. In their most important game of the season, the Lions played their finest all-around football. The showdown with Tampa would settle it. The year before, it had taken a third step of a tiebreaker to eliminate Detroit from the playoffs. Would the frustration of second place finishes end in 1981? Lions fans everywhere were ready for this one. On the first one, run right, right through them down there. Let's go. Let's Let's come go. up with them. Start it off. We get James the ball in the second go. half. Let's start it right here. Let's go to work. Go. The tightly contested first half ended with Detroit down by three. The final half of the regular season would hold the answer. It did not go well for the Lions. This touchdown gave Tampa a 20 to 10 fourth quarter lead. Hipple immediately brought the Lions to the brink of a score. But this time, 
there was to be no payoff. The division title fading with every tick on the clock, the Lions refused to die. Detroit scored with just over a minute left in the game to cut Tampa's lead to 20 to 17. But the Lions could accomplish no more. The elusive title had slipped away. A season of photo finish outcomes ended with Detroit second again just shy of the winner's circle in what was among the Lions' most exciting seasons in years. In 1981, the Lions learned that they can compete with any team in the NFL. They also learned that that's not enough. It was a year marked by many outstanding team and individual accomplishments, performances that earned for the Lions the respect of the entire league, but the missing ingredient was consistency. The new season awaits. With renewed confidence, the Lions are certain that the sparkling moments and the lessons learned in 1981 will bring them ever closer to their goal of winning a championship.